Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's program. We're going to begin with session three. In this session, we're addressing indoor chemistry and exposure. And it's going to kick off with Dr. Crystal Pollitt speaking to us about indoor chemistry and exposure. Her title is, We Are Living in a Material World, Indoor Chemistry and Exposure. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Crystal Pollitt. Uh, she's presently at Yale, an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences. She also has an appointment in the Yale School of Engineering and Applied Science. Um, her background, she got her BS and master's degree at University of Toronto, chemical engineering. And uh, then she went to London. And uh, there she got a PhD in toxicology, chemical toxicology from King's College. Uh, her research has focused on different approaches to evaluating our exposure to chemicals. Uh, an example is using high resolution mass spectrometry and non-targeted analysis to examine some of the chemicals that we are exposed to. She's developed and deployed wristbands that sorb chemicals from the air. And she can then analyze those wristbands for, I think, literally almost a thousand compounds. Um, she has received from the International Society of Exposure Science, the Joan M. Daisy Outstanding Young Scientist Award. From Yale School of Public Health, she's received the Early Career Research Award. And with that, I bring you Dr. Pollack. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, and I thought after lunch, we needed a little bit of a provocative title just to uh, to get you thinking. Um, and we really are living in a material world from everything that we have talked about. We have a number of different sources around us. And as we move into the next session, I want you to look around and think about what is in your indoor space around you. If you're joining us here in person, so looking around this room, thinking, and then also back at home for those that are online, what does the space look like that you are in now? Other spaces that you are frequenting? What are chemicals around you? What are other features of that indoor space? What aspects of this material world around us are then impacting your exposures? How might that differ from others living in your house? How has that changed over time as well? What are other factors that are then going to further modify uh, what these exposures look like? So here's a picture of a wonderful PhD student that I'm fortunate to work with, Elizabeth Lynn, and she is studiously working in our office space at the Yale School of Public Health in New Haven. Uh, and we can think about what her exposures are like there. So she's busy working on her thesis and she's ingesting water in a water bottle. She has a good source of snacks there uh, as well uh, that she has exposures through ingestion around her. We can also think about her dermal contacts that she has around her personal care products, different cosmetics around, be it lotions or sanitizer that we so frequently use, that's also present. But then we can also think about inhalation exposures. And you know, I've opened the entire picture up because there are chemicals that are coming into the air from what we have talked about earlier in this workshop from so many different places. So we have many, many sources of particles as well as gas phase chemicals that are coming from all around. So we can look at what I talked about before related to the water she's consuming, contaminants that are volatilizing into the air, different food products that we also see within the air, be it additives, preservatives uh, that are no longer just uh, within that, that food product there. We also have remnants residues from the cleaning products that are, are being released, other fragrances, be it from cosmetic products, from personal care products uh, that, that are being applied in different ways. Textiles and garments, also mentioned previously being a source um, and a sink for, for these different chemicals. We can look at pharmaceuticals that do not stay put within that, say, medicine ingredient, but we see them also volatizing. We've been able to detect those within the air. 
We can look at features of the built environment as well. So building materials, be it from the building material itself to other applications of coatings we put on there with paints, resuspension of dust, the carpets are radiating chemicals, as many of us in this room have also measures. And then we can think about other locations as well, be it from different other combustion products, smoking, cooking, and other environments, and then also pollutants that have originated from outdoors that are infiltrating inside. So this is an incredibly complex uh, mixture that we are exposed to. So this extensive list of sources that we're exposed to are all environmental influences that are going to impact our health. And understanding how this complex mixture of exposures and from these various sources, that's the motivation for my work. So what I'm showing here, this environmental health paradigm that's going all the way from sources to exposure to health. And it's an incredibly complex pathway that we have here. We've already discussed in this workshop the, the range of different sources that are present within our indoor spaces. What this means in terms of transformation, their fate, their dispersion um, within the, these environments and their transports. But today I'm gonna to focus solely on the exposure. And this is my area that I, I really love to, to study and be able to develop measurement techniques that operationalize our ability to study exposure at the personal scale and in different environmental uh, indoor spaces. And I'll share some of these findings that we've learned from studies to date. So three different aspects that I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to share some examples of studies where we've looked at indoor exposures and the chemical diversity that we see in different indoor spaces. I'll talk about spatial variability that we've been able to detect within individual households, but then also between households as well. And then finally, I'll talk about the dynamic nature of these exposures. So how do they change over time? And then how are they also influenced by occupants' practices, their consumer product use, as well as their behaviors? Okay, so before I get into all of that, I'm gonna start with just some of the measurement science, the techniques that we are using to be able to facilitate all of these studies. And the way that we go about capturing the human experience, so this lived experience from all these different places that we, we go to on a daily, uh, um, in our daily routine, we use silicone films, very simple material. We've talked a lot previously about surfaces and now we're just taking an aspect of the surface. And silicone is a fantastic material for being able to collect a range of different chemicals. Within my studies, we use a specific type of silicone, um, silicone uh, called polydimethylsiloxane or PDMS. The sorption properties of PDMS are proportional to the octanol air partitioning coefficient or the log KOA. And to give you a sense for the range of different compounds, the more prevalent chemicals that we're able to detect, we can have a range of different VOCs, PAHs, PCBs, a range of different pesticides, PPDEs, phthalates. And most recently, we've also been able to show that we can effectively sample a range of different PFAS um, as well, given um, the emergence of this chemical contaminant. We understand the sampling behavior using these silicone films with passive sampling for gas phase constituents. When we, are, when we start sampling with these, these compounds, we can look at this x-axis here with the sampling time in which we would have them uh, be collecting an exposure estimate for. We'll start with a linear phase of uptake of chemicals into the silicone film, where chemicals are taken up by the sorbents at, uh, over time by, at a constant rate. This uptake rate is gonna depend on the thickness of a stationary boundary layer so stagnant layer of air over top of that polymer film above the sorbents. As we increase the amount of chemical that's taken up by that polymer film, we then approach through a curvilinear phase into an equilibrium phase where the uptake rate equals the loss rates. Then that rate is then controlled by the partitioning between the sorbent and the air um, for that chemical. By understanding these uptake kinetics, it's key for them being able to then quantify our exposures to the different chemicals. So we have deployed these passive samplers in various forms, and then we're able to use high resolution mass spectrometry to then measure the mass of chemicals that have been captured, that have been absorbed by these, um, these films. 
And when we measure that, we can then express that in a picogram amount or the amount of sorbent or uh, silicone uh, that we've analyzed. But then understanding how long we've sampled for, we can then apply a conversion mass loading factor. If we deploy for a shorter amount of time and we're still within this linear range of uptake, we can apply an uptake rate. Or if we're sampling within the equilibrium range, we can then apply an equilibrium, equilibrium absorption coefficients. And the key to being using that is then we can then convert that mass loading into a volumetric concentration to then estimate con uh, exposure concentration. So we can now have that comparable to many other different um, forms of measurement for evaluating chemical exposures in the air. So we have the silicone film. We understand how its uptake uh, uh, behaves. And now we've started embedding it into wearable forms. So we can put it in a non-invasive type of wearable form like a wristband. And you can go around and do all of your daily activities variable amounts of uh, physical activity um, and not have it be a burden or create any type of immobilization or change to, to what you would normally do. So the silicone film that we have, we, uh, we have it contained within a bar form that we call a PDMS sorbent bar. We put it into a sampling case. So that means that we are only sampling chemicals that are from the air. We have four replicates that we typically put into a sampler that we deploy with an individual. So we have replicates, we can analyze one, have backups, be able to then analyze those at a later, later date. The sampling case also provides a stagnant boundary layer. As I mentioned, that's key for having normalizing the rate of uptake of compounds. And we've done a, a amount of uh, computational flow modeling. So we understand the variation of that boundary for different types of movements from say sedentary activity to um, high paced, more uh, physical um, intense activities. And we still see a consistency which in that boundary layer. So now we've normalized uh, and have a, a constant rate of uptake. And then that means we can quantify what our exposure concentrations are using this wearable form in a picogram per cubic meter amount. So that's incredibly powerful when we start relating that and thinking about what that means in terms of health to have a quantified measure of exposure uh, with standardized units. So we've also thought about other vulnerable populations, right? We don't wanna just characterize an adult going around. Uh, we know that childhood, especially early life, are gonna introduce increased susceptibilities to different chemical exposures. So we've come up with alternative wearable forms uh, that we can put onto babies. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to be able to test this out even at home with my little one and uh, compliance is good, uh, <laughs> not a choking hazard. Uh, and we've also deployed it uh, within studies as well uh, to be a usable wearable form that we can detect early life exposures. But we can also put it on other vulnerable populations. Throughout childhood, we can look during pregnancy to think about prenatal exposures, older adults as well that might have more limited mobility, especially also um, different types of disease populations. We can use the exact same type of wearable and then put that into a clip form and use it now as a stationary area monitor. So we can use the same approach, the same means for analytical as well as computational analysis uh, for the chemical exposures in different fixed locations, be those indoors or outdoors. So we now have a harmonized technique that we can evaluate exposures um, in different environments. We have a high throughput form for chemical analysis. And this is key. If we wanna be able to deploy this type of measurement technology to look at a range of different environments, very large populations that we need to be able to study health, then we have to be able to do this on a large scale. So we have these wristband devices that we have kits that we send out um, to different populations internationally. They're worn typically for anywhere from one to 14 days, depending on the study design. Once they're returned back to the lab, we're then able to uh, use an internal standard that allows us um, to have quality controls and standardization. And then we thermally desorb the compounds off of that silicone film. So that speeds up the entire process. We're no longer doing a solvent extraction um, and creates a bottleneck. That thermal desorption goes directly onto the inlets of a high resolution mass spectrometer. We're using a gas chromatography uh, technique for separation. And then that allows us to then have a data set uh, to do exposure assessment with. 
By use of a high resolution mass spec, we're then fortunate to use different techniques to be able to mine the data. And we've spent a lot of time developing our computational workflows, standardizing those, making them as rigorous as possible so that we can have three different means for analyzing what our um, exposures are. We can use a targeted approach where we have uh, authenticated analytical standards that we include with every batch. We include about 100 of those for cost-related reasons, balancing um, for prevalent compounds with known um, uh, health outcomes of concern. And with this, we're able to provide then quantified exposures in this picogram per cubic meter amounts. But then we can also use and we can mine our high-res mass spec data to do a suspect screening analysis. This starts letting us get to about 500 compounds that we're able to detect from a single wristband. So this really excites me, just being able to wear a wristband, you can now get at this, uh, this breadth of chemical structures that we're able to confidently annotate. This is a semi-quantitative technique because we are using um, a library-based screening approach. But then we can get really interesting and then also do non-targeted analysis. And this is now letting us get to 10,000 plus chemical features that we can get by wearing a single wristband. These are more qualitative based approaches, but still it's giving us an indication for what is present within our exposures from a range of different sources. Okay, so let's start here. Indoor exposures are chemically diverse. I'm gonna share a study that we worked on and we're really lucky to work with a fantastic group uh, of environmental epidemiologists at Boston University. And we worked on a study called uh, Presto for one component of it. So this is an internet based preconception uh, cohort study. And we had 139 women from across the US, from 39 states, wear the wristbands, uh, and they wore it for five days. So we had a kit we developed, we sent that out to them, they wore the wristband for five days, they sent it back. They were all within the range of 21 to 45 years, interested in trying to conceive. So really interested in different types of exposures, influencing reproductive health. We did over a fairly narrow band from a June to November stretch, and then we also had a range of different questionnaires that Presto was asking that we were able to leverage to be able to uh, look at time activity patterns. I'm presenting the study here because we did this during COVID. A lot of these women were spending time at home indoors, greater than 90% of their time. So a lot of their exposures then can be representative of their indoor environments. So I'm showing results here to start from exposures from our targeted analysis, where we're just looking at more prevalent compounds that are better understood um, with recognized um, health outcomes. So I'll start here and orient you with this figure. So here is showing a range of different pHs, and you can see the distribution of the pHs that are being detected. Each one of those dots is one individual from this cohort. And then shown on the right-hand side there is the detection frequency across those 139 participants. And you can see just that these are prevalent compounds. We're detecting them for most, for most of these compounds across our entire population. But then we can also look at other compounds uh, that we're seeing very frequently across this population. We can see a range of different flame retardants, different pesticides, smoking related compounds from nicotine to THC9. There were women that reported that they were active smokers, that they were smoking marijuana as well. We were able to cross validate that with their wristband measures. And we did see those as being outliers in terms of the magnitude of their exposures. Cosmetic products coming from a range of different sources and phthalates. I'm just highlighting a couple here. And you can see for a range of these compounds, they are, all have high detection frequencies that we find. So we can dive into this a little further and we can then apply our suspect screening techniques. And when we use these library um, searches, we can identify about 500 different compounds, 491 unique chemicals that we confidently annotate. We paired this data with a fantastic resource from the EPA called the Comtax dashboard that includes 1.2, over 1.2 million compounds. And we use that to be able to screen for potential product usage associated with each one of these compounds. These compounds are coming from a range of different sources. Some of them are food related, flavorants, pharmaceuticals, as I mentioned before, we can detect, they migrate, they off gas from uh, the different medications that these um, individuals were reporting that we were able to cross validate, combustion products, pesticides, antimicrobials, and a range of different smoking compounds as well. 
So we can then push this one step further with Comtox and be able to then also look at predicted toxicity. So this is really powerful because when we have a list of over 500 compounds, we wanna be able to scream for what are the predicted and known toxicities. And when we look at this list here for the suspect screening, we're able to find that there are a number of chemicals of concern. Most of these are endocrine disruptors, which again, streams of concern when we're looking at a preconception cohort. We look at concerns related to development. Again, this is a concern for this cohort. And a number of them, 68, were also identified to have reproductive hazards. This is powerful information. We can take it a step further and I can show you some of the results from our non-targeted analysis. So this is really the most comprehensive analysis that we're able to do that provides insight into the indoor chemistry um, to which these, these individuals are exposed. I'm showing here a molecular network of the uh, chemical features that we've identified. And each one of the clusters that you're seeing here indicates chemicals that are structurally similar. So we can look at and I can highlight what some of these, these chemical clusters are. We see aromatic hydrocarbons, we see oxygenated hydrocarbons uh, within this mix here, oxygenated alkanes. And then we can also look at some other compounds that are of known issues when we think about reproductive health, including sicilic acid um, and benzoates. So I'll dive a little bit further into this benzoate cluster. So all of the, the compounds that I've highlighted there in red have potential sources. And then I pulled just a couple of them out to see what these potential sources are for the compounds we, we've detected. So remember, these are still detected within these wristbands uh, that are within indoor air. Some of them are found within cosmetic products and then other ones we've seen as potential preservatives within food products as well that we're able to detect with this high res mass spec technique at trace levels. There was another really interesting aspect to the study that I loved is that we were able in a subset of the population of that 139 females also give wristbands to their male partners. They spent most of their time in the same indoor environment. So now we're able to look at differential exposure of occupants in the same household and see if they were differences, which is really cool. And we were able to find that when we looked over that prevalent list of about 100 compounds that we measured for their target analysis, they were similar. But when we started to dig further into that data and pull out that suspect screening data of that 491 compounds, that's when we saw some differences. And what's what I showed here on this volcano applause, looking at differences between females versus males. So what's higher in the females is shown in green, what's higher in the males is shown in, in, uh, in blue. So we see some food-related compounds higher uh, in, in females. We have some compounds that we weren't able to identify what a potential source was because it wasn't found within Comtox. But then there's also a range of other compounds that the males were higher exposed to. Different flavorants, different preservatives, different food-related compounds. So this all tracks back to differences within activity patterns, differences within consumer use. So being within the same household and assuming that you have the same exposure as a consequence is not the case. So much of it depends on our personalized use of consumer products and our activity patterns. So we have to understand that if we want to be able to then further understand what that consequence on health is going to be when we have these exposures. Okay. So let's move on to the second one the spatial variability within households and between households. So following up on that, we found that there were differences between males and females. We thought, well, can we further pry to see what the spatial variability is within households? And again, we worked on another really cool study. We partnered with uh, a group at uh, EPFL in Switzerland, uh, and we were able to deploy these passive samplers in 37 homes in Switzerland and three uh, cities. Uh, with participants that were all adults, 21 to 58 years. And we were able to collect six samples from each one of their homes. The condition was, is that they had to work in their homes. We're doing this during COVID in uh, 2021. They had to have a single level home. So it was a contained smaller uh, type of apartment. And then we put the samplers, one on their terrace. So they all had a balcony. So we put it right outside. So we could look at outdoor exposures. And at the same time, over the same five-day periods, they also had a sampler in their living room, in their bathroom, in their bedroom, and in their kitchen. 
And then to top it off to get, you know, more data, they also wore wristbands. So we could see how there were differential exposures, if there were, in the different spaces, in smaller spaces compared to larger dwellings that we might have within the United States, and then how they interacted with those spaces to see the key factors in the different locations that were driving exposure. It was a beautiful study design. <laughs> it made me very happy. <laughs> Uh, so pairing with um, the meticulous collection of samples, the PhD students um, that worked on this also had uh, a tremendous um, a questionnaire uh, that logged their time activity. Most of their time was spent at home as per our condition um, for enrollment within the study, 94% of their time. And then we looked at what the breakdown was for these people, uh, how they spent their time within their spaces. Most of their time was spent in their bedroom, you know, sleeping. Uh, they did a lot of their work in their home office or their living room, some time within their kitchen, and then a little bit of time in their washroom, so 2%. I'm gonna show you some of these results here. So this is from our targeted analysis. We're just focusing on um, a limited panel. I'm showing here uh, a plot of chemicals that we detected in the different indoor locations, bathroom, kitchen, living room, and bedroom. And it's showing a Z-score. So the Z-score is representing if there is an increase, an increase over the mean of the other indoor locations. And they're ranked here based on highest to lowest for the different environments. So immediately what comes to your eye is that the most number of elevated exposures across the panel that are measured here are found in the bathroom. Not overly surprising, right? It's a closed environment, huge number of products that are used there, personal care, cosmetic products, the highest levels. We also saw some that were elevated within the kitchen. So this particular one was from a food compound. And then we looked at, uh, there was a fewer number that were also coming from uh, the bedroom as well. So then we probed a little bit more, and then we did a correlation analysis to see how did those compounds vary between the different locations? So the, was there a higher correlation between some that might suggest perhaps different amounts of dispersion or um, uh, then also exposure with um, interaction uh, with uh, personal exposures? So what I'm showing here on this, uh, this inset here, these, uh, these little series of dots, is the different exposures in the different locations. And then if there is a line, a black line connecting them, that means that we detected a significant correlation between those compounds. So in this case here, there's a red dot um, for this particular personal care product that was the highest detected within the bathroom. We see that that's then correlated with personal exposures as well as then the living room. So we see that having those elevated uh, um, exposures within the bathroom then did lead to a signature that we detected on the wristband, despite only having 2% of their time activity log within that space. We can then look at other types of personal care products as well that were detected within the bathroom. So home acetate and then a, a musk ketone, also highest detected within the bathroom. And then we see that a signature of that in the different environments as well. Some of those compounds didn't follow the same trends. So this was a particular compound, a food-related compound that we found within the kitchen, highest levels within the kitchen, but we did not see that then associated with the wristband-based exposures. So we see differences in how these compounds migrate um, and how we're interacting with these, these, uh, these compounds. For the bedroom as well, we see differential patterns in terms of how these correlations are happening. So for the particular pesticide that had the highest concentrations, we see a correlation with the outdoor environment. And as we do these, um, these correlation analysis, we can then start to have cues in terms of what potential sources um, of exposure uh, might be in the sources that they originate from. So I'll end here with one last study uh, where we looked at the dynamic nature of these exposures. Again, a really nicely designed study. We we're fortunate to pair uh, and work with the China CDC Unfortunately, we did this right before COVID, uh, and we measured indoor air longitudinally. So I measure, we measure it indoor air, but we measured it in a personal form where people spent most of their time indoors. We're able to have people, about 80 people, wear the wristband every month for five consecutive months, three days every single month, starting in September, going all the way until January. So really nice that we could track the same people over time. 
This was also done in another beautifully designed study where the China CDC partners that we had tracked everything. They tracked all aspects of their activities from their window openings to their cooking, the time spent indoors, uh, their product use, and they even had pre-prepared meals for them as well that everyone got standardized. In parallel with that, they took biological samples of everything from urine to blood. They took it at all time points and then did a lot of other physiological measurements in that well. We paired that also with outdoor data so we could see differential exposures between indoors versus outs and personal. And then I'll just highlight some cases here from personal care products, pest control, diets, cleaning activities. We can look at these exposures now over time from September to January. And what's shown here within this box plot is the concentrations that we detected for this particular uh, compound dichlorvos, which is a product used for mosquito control, a banned substance, but given the population, they historically had come to use it and it was a cultural practice where they placed it under their beds. It wasn't accounted for originally within our activity logs, but because we detected it, we went back and they all did then confirm use. We can see higher concentrations in the warmer months, cooler in the, uh, less in the cooler months, as you would expect, but it follows our assumption or trends. Similarly, we can look at other products like limonene, so this will come from a range of different food sources as well as cleaning sources. We see increased exposure as there is decreased window opening time. So less ventilation, higher concentrations that we detect indoors. Other compounds that didn't have any change across the five month time periods, we see no variation, no significant variance from the start warm to cold period. Things like triclosan, an antibacterial microbial that we find within personal care products, we find that migrating out into the air that we're detecting with the wristbands. And this one I found really interesting, food preservatives as well, we also found. Um, and because they had a consistency of diet, a standardized diet over the five months uh, for those three days, uh, they also had consistent exposures. We tried then to look for predictors of exposures and we did a principal component analysis. We found that two clusters were identified uh, that explained about 50% of the variance. We then looked at the breakdown to see what compounds were associated with those two clusters. So in the first one, it was primarily loaded with PHs. And in the second one here, we have a range of other volatile compounds, some, um, some ethers, um, uh, a nitrobenzene, and some naphthalenes as well. When we then did a random forest analysis to look at predictors of behavioral and environmental features, we were then able to find three uh, factors that then were primarily associated with uh, just the second factor, so more of those volatile compounds. Heavily driven by outdoor temperature, the month that they was assessed, ranging from September to uh, January, and then also the window opening time. So these building practices were really driving what the exposures were. And sure enough, when we then looked at how people's activity pattern changed with the amount of time that they spend outdoors, we can then differentiate what some of the sources of exposure were, their origin uh, or origination of some of these pollutants uh, if they were indoors or outdoors. So here I'm showing a plot for the amount of time spent outside while wearing the wristband over the three days. Uh, for one particular compound, a hexachlorobutadiene, and we see increased exposure with more time spent outdoors, suggesting then an outdoor source uh, or, uh, origination. And then we can do the exact same type of analysis for indoor sources um, to start looking at where we might be having the sources of these compounds. Okay, so overall, uh, I hope that I've been able to show you um, some advances uh, in measurement technologies and see this as a real um, way that we can start operationalizing how we do exposure assessments to better understand indoor chemistry uh, as well. And by coupling these passive samplers with high resolution techniques, we now have this omic scale measurements of chemicals in indoor air, and that's really powerful. The non-invasive design lets us get at a range of different geographies, a range of different um, environments as well by having a harmonized approach. The indoor air as a consequence for which we can measure is chemically diverse. And then we also have uh, a highly dynamic environment that is influenced by our behaviors as well as our consumer use. So moving forwards, a couple of thoughts. Addressing data inconsistencies, we need harmonized approaches that are robust, reliable, and rigorous. We need a framework that's going to have a standardized method of measurements, 
with standardized protocols, data collection, and analytical methods. These need to include analytical methods as well as computational methods, right? As we use these high-res mass spec methods, it's generating tremendous amounts of data so to define best practices. As we do these measurements, we have to think about health. We have uh, an extremely complex chemical mixture to which we are exposed, all the way from emissions from known sources to transformation products. And we have to be able to then evaluate and understand what that means in terms of human health and disease. And this then uh, can potentially guide policy decisions. We're talking at this workshop here about indoor chemistry. But I want to push this forward and say we need to think about the ensemble of exposures. So all of the exposures that we are exposed to. Chemistry is just one. And when we think about all these exposures, it's also the physical exposures. It is also the biological exposures. It's the psychosocial exposures that will drive biology. So taking an exposomic approach using systems um, to, to look at what that means in terms of our health. And finally, we're doing all this measurement, we're thinking about health, we also have to have actionable solutions. We need to be able to capture product use, activity use to understand chemistry, right? But that also then has benefits for being able to enable precision interventions to mitigate exposures. So with that, I'll wrap up there and thank my fantastic team uh, that I'm fortunate to work with and then all of our wonderful collaborators and funding sources. Thank you. I'm afraid we're a bit short on time, but let's take one question before we move to the panel. Hi, and thank you so much for this uh, presentation. It really gave us uh, a great sense of the diversity and, uh, and the dynamic nature of uh, uh, these indoor um, species. I was wondering about uh, the time uh, variability again, and, Particularly, I was wondering if you observed change over time. I remember a conversation I had a few years ago with Kenichi Azuma, who did a survey of indoor VOCs in Japanese homes. And one thing that stuck with me is that he said that at the end of this, by the end of the study, they were seeing already different compounds that at the beginning and that's part of the conversation we had today what do we bring in our homes and these products change did, did you see any evidence for changes in in your uh, measurement so there was a study that i showed uh, that was based in china where we we sampled over a five-month time course ideally if we had sampled longer we would i would expect to see even greater changes but we, we did get the, the peaks of hotter to cooler uh, and as we showed with the, the PCA random forest analysis, that much of uh, the exposures that we see indoors are going to be impacted uh, by seasonal changes and in the outdoor environment. So yes, I, I showed a couple, but we, we can look further and, and we can see, especially within those VOCs, that they would be dramatic changes seasonally. Thank you. Would, would you please take a seat at the... Panel, and I'll ask the other panelists to step up, and uh, in a moment, I'll introduce them. The focus of this panel discussion is going to be the connection, the handshake between indoor chemistry and indoor exposure. <laughs> Dr. Antonio Califat is the chief of the organic analytical toxicology branch at CDC. And she is a world expert on biomarkers and has been very involved in the NHANES biomarker program that many of you are familiar with. Um, Dr. Jason Ham is a research scientist at the Health Effects Laboratory Division in at NIOSH in Morgantown. And uh, Jason has done lots of measurements of various reactions, their rates, their mechanisms that occur indoors. Dr. Elaine Cohen Hubble is a senior science advisor to the US EPA. She's also editor in chief 
of JESEE, -E, that's the Journal of Exposure Science and Environmental Epidemiology. And I forgot to mention that Dr. Antonio Califat is editor in chief of the International Journal of Hygiene and Environmental Health. So we'd have two journal editors sitting on the panel today. You know Crystal, you just heard her deliver a fascinating presentation. And then Trey Thomas is the lead toxicologist and program manager. You've heard him ask some probing questions today in the uh, Chemicals, Technology, and Emerging Materials Program at the Consumer Products Safety Commission. And with that, I'll begin with a question that I'll direct to Elaine, but invite all the panelists to, uh, to comment on. What important exposures, influenced by indoor chemistry, might we be missing? Where do you see the research gaps? Okay, thank you, Charlie. So, um, oh, I didn't talk to Crystal before. I wrote up my, I, since I haven't really been uh, intimately involved with this group, even though I've certainly followed the work over the years, I, I actually spent a couple of days thinking about the question. Um, and, um, and Crystal just set things up perfectly. But what we've heard today, um, and I think we'll hear a little bit more after this one, is that um, buildings and people are complex and dynamic. Um, sources of chemicals in buildings change. Right, so the materials, the products, the behaviors, these things are not constant um, and, they, and they're changing more rapidly than ever before. Um, and then I, I, I think I saw some things in the report, but climate change and climate adaptation practices are gonna have consequences for indoor um, chemistry and certainly for exposures. So, um, I just want to kind of, in terms of gaps and what exposures, you know, we should be looking for, I want to sort of throw out this idea that um, we hear a lot of today in terms of use-inspired research. And we had a perfect example of that in the last panel, um, but I'm just going to throw out sort of three broader ones. And, the, and, and we've already heard a lot of people sort of allude or even... Um, outright express these kinds of ideas. So nothing I'm saying is new, I'm just gonna reiterate. Um, but focusing on solutions, use-inspired research focuses on solutions and design designing research that's gonna provide actionable information. And it gets a little overwhelming when we think about the complexity that we've heard about today. Um, so to do use-inspired research, what tools uh, do we need to develop and deploy? to um, in particular measure. I, I'm, I'm really liking the emphasis on measuring, but I've, we've heard really good um, information about uh, ideas about how to use models. Um, so what tools do we need to develop and deploy to measure, predict, mitigate, and monitor indoor chemistry so that we can really minimize exposure to toxic chemical mixtures and, you know, I know everybody's goal is really to foster a healthy indoor environment, not just today, but in the future, right? So we have a lot of work to do. Um, and I'm just going to um, reiterate that it's, I, I would posit that we really need to move beyond regulatory exposure assessment methodologies. Um, we're going to get really stuck if those are the kinds of exposure, um, you, the, the regulators have to to do those assessments, but they've been struggling for we, they, I'm, I don't do regulatory <laughs> exposure assessment, but struggling to how, how you get around, address complexity mixtures and everything else. And we heard a really good thought today in terms of where, uh, you know, this group could engage, but I'm gonna just say that actually I'm, I'm a real advocate of more of the kind of approach that Crystal is proposing. So I really think there has to be a lot more um, taking advantage of advances in data-driven approaches and doing more of a fusion of the complex chemistry that we're hearing about today, the dynamic characteristics of the indoor environment and human behavior uh, without necessarily getting at the mechanistic details of all those things. Um, and I would also sort of argue that human 
behavior is not necessarily something that we can get at in a first principles way in the way that engineers, and I'm actually trained in a chemical engineer, in the way that engineers think about first principles. Um, so just to throw out my three sort of use-driven things, um, one, I would say, is sort of where more of the fundamental kinds of things come in, but this is where um, as a as like a society, we're going to want to um, engage is screening to identify new and emerging concerns. So I think we've heard a lot about that in terms of how we would measure. But what is the minimal set of measures that can be collected in surveys and health studies, right? So if you want to connect to exposure and health, um, we have a lot of surveys that this government does um, implement. And there are opportunities, but, but we're not always prepared to get those measurements in because they do need to be minimal um, and they need to be efficient. And then we need to have to do that, the data-driven models, including machine learning methods. Crystal had to like fly through her last example, but there are, there's some amazing stuff in there. And where we are using machine learning to get at um, the potential predictors and surrogates um, as determinants of exposure, and then, um, and I'll keep, I'll go faster, but mechanistic models would have to be a part of this, and that's predict to predict potential for wider sets of compounds from those minimal measurements um, over time and space. Uh, so that's one use-inspired uh, use, uh, um, example. The other one would be screening for safety, and again, I do mean measuring, um, sort of the way we do now for radon, what minimal set of measures can be collected? So the first set are people are, are collected in surveys by researchers, right? This set is what are this what are the minimal sets that can be collected by building managers or residents, and that they could then send to a certified lab. But one day the goal would be to have the sensors um, measuring in situ. We're moving toward the Internet of Things and our smart homes and all this stuff, and we can like think from a market driven perspective. What's the uses that this community, uh, you know, beyond um, grants, uh, you know, from federal money, there's, there is, there is a compelling market for what you all do. Um, and so with that would be guidance to do something with those results, right? What are, how do you eliminate the sources, remove the contaminants, or transform the chemicals? And those need to be specific and, and targeted to the set of measurements. And then the final one I'll just throw out is planning for climate change and climate, climate adaptation. And this is gonna have to be a lot where your science feeds in to these uh, models that can be used to look um, at different scenarios. So models here that designers, building operators and policymakers can use to evaluate new materials, and technologies for constructing buildings and modifying existing ones. And um, with that would be the technologies then for monitoring indoor chemistry that can be deployed um, in a range of indoor environments. And there, again, huge market, it's compelling. Um, and then I'll just end by saying that I did look, um, EPA's Indoor Environments Division did charge their um, Clean Air Act Advisory Committee with prioritizing uh, your your uh, report, the um, recommendations. And the number one priority that they um, came out with was prioritizing uh, acquisition of actionable data and research to link sources with exposures and understand impacts of mixtures on health. So, um, you know, I think that's all kind of aligned. Thank you, Elaine. Would other panelists like to comment? Are there chemicals that we are being exposed to today that we are missing? And I, I heard you, Antonia, say, oh, yes. <laughs> so would you, would you please elaborate? I mean, I'm pretty sure, I mean, there are tens of thousands of chemicals that are used uh, in commerce, and uh, we are only able to uh, measure and, uh, and tackle just a few of them. So I'm pretty sure we're exposed to tons of chemicals, not in isolation, even though it tends to be, at least for targeted analysis, how we measure them one by one, because this is how our framework for regulation is, is set up. But uh, we 
oftentimes you hear people say, we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg. Yes, we are only looking at the tip of the iceberg, but being optimistic is better looking at some than looking at none. So I'm hopeful that little by little we're making some progress, but yeah, we're missing some for sure. Thank you, Antonia. Uh, Elaine, yes. So just, uh, just one more point on that, which I guess I missed, but related to um, Antonio's comment is that um, we are, you know, looking under the lamppost and the, the, the point of these untargeted, these non-targeted approaches um, is, is to be able to use kind of this more ex exposomic thinking where we are looking for what are the, the biggest differences, right? So using that data-driven kind of approach to say, what, where are we seeing big differences in um, these clusters of different patterns of chemicals? And then you can do the deeper dive you know, to go figure out sources and and um, and chemistry and things, but it, I just think we're just we have no choice but to move in this direction. Thank you, Elaine. Other comments, um, Crystal. You're doing non-targeted analysis, and that has the advantage of alerting us to chemicals that we might not be thinking of. But the chemical has to reach the detector in the first place, right? You raise a, an excellent point. And, and so at, as we move to, to measuring all exposures, this, this exposomic approach, I don't think that we can, <clears throat> we can limit ourselves by, by the perfect. We have to go with what is feasible. And we know that we are able to be more comprehensive with these approaches, with these non-target methods. And that still provides a very rich repository of, of sources that we didn't previously appreciate that we now are able to study. True. <laughs> um, Elaine, I see you want to say one more thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're, it's been so exciting today. Barbara made some amazing points about the iterative nature of needing to do, you know, sort of the experimental lab, you know, lab scale kinds of studies. And I think that that's, like that, you know, having that um, mechanistic, I'm in no way suggesting that we uh, abandon the mechanistic um, side of things. That's really critical. But if you sort of know which things mechanistically you would expect to see together, and you're only measuring the ones that are getting to whatever sampling medium or media, I hope, then you ought to be able to go back to what you've learned experimentally and, and connect those dots. Uh, thank you, Elaine. I, uh, speaking personally, I do worry that there's classes of chemicals that we're doing a poor job on today and includes thermally labile compounds. I see uh, Vicki wants to comment here. <laughs> and, uh, and, and compounds that do have, um, are going to condense before they reach the detector. Vicky. Yeah, I just wanted to ask one question, and, and we uh, Crystal didn't get a lot of questions, and she did give a really nice talk, and so it's directed to you, but anybody on the panel who makes these measurements can answer about exposures. And my question is, you know, you have this very specific way of collecting and then analyzing. What percentage of the organic compounds that are present are you measuring? What percentage is unknown? And the reason why I ask that is a lot of times, if you do the mass balance, and uh, Barb mentioned this, zero to 100%, a lot of times the majority is unknown. And I'm just wondering, in your measurements, if you have an idea about that. Excellent question. Challenging one. Uh, so I, I suppose the, the root of that is that we haven't measured that total to know what percentage that we are detecting. Uh, and we are just measuring organics. But we can then use the same sampling strategy, say, to do ICPMS, and we can measure metals with particles deposit, deposited on there. During COVID, we were able to spin the same device and repurpose it to measure respiratory viruses. So now we can then do a biological type of analysis. So I think we can we can start thinking about other other technologies and different analytical methods that we can we can pair with it. <laughs> Thank you. I oh <laughs> okay, Jason. So yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree that you know 
as you already mentioned, this carbon mass balance, we lose about, or we're missing about 50% of this stuff. And, you know, so new technologies and in, in actually using new chemistry, such as derivatization chemistry, to look at these oxygenated products that are formed due to these reactions is something that's hopefully getting to discovering at least a few more percent of that mass balance. But as Tali already pointed out, we still need more technology to understand these uh, this transient chemicals, these radicals that are being formed, which we really don't have a good handle on just yet. Also, because those are going to be formed at lower concentrations, presumably, than the parent compound, you're going to need methodologies that have exquisite sensitivity. And um, that sometimes, you know, when we look at a lot of things, then um, we lose some sen sensitivity. So we're going to have to look at uh, complementary tools and complementary approaches that I think in my mind, they're not exclusive from each other, but they just help each other. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I have a question I'd like to start with Trey first on. Um, in the case of consumer products, how do you treat, how do you address chemicals not originally present but formed later by a chemical transformation. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think, you know, for those not familiar with CPSC, we have a wide jurisdiction, and also the comments that I make are mine, and not necessarily those of the commission. But you know, it's been said earlier that we tend to have we look at at we approach it by a product by product basis. And I think when we talk about this more broadly in terms of the exposure science, I think we want to have a good idea uh, or really a robust understanding of what happens when you use these products in an, in an exposure scenario. What is released, what's what's in the product matrix, what is released, uh, what are the other compounds that are released, and then what happens to them. So I think it goes to your question about the byproducts. We certainly have seen that there's questions, for example, with ozone, and we talked about ozone generating air cleaners, and what happens in the indoor environment. I think part of the challenge, as we've all talked about, that's been just well stated is how complex it is. I mean, when you think of just products under our jurisdiction, everything from large products uh, that may be sources of VOCs like mattresses, furniture, wood, all the way down to uh, household cleaners and everything in between. And uh, even exposures when we talk about that we use like toys and so forth that where, you know, there's direct contact and, you know, what happens. So, I think that since we're talking about research, we need to clearly understand what are those releases we've talked about. Do we have how long do they last, and you know what are those interactions that do occur? And again, and it may change uh, seasonally, temporally. I mean, what you know if you're mopping the floor and there's limonene, or the air exchange rates that occur if it's in the summer versus winter, and are we talking about a studio apartment or a McMansion, and what type of you know, uh, you know, air exchanges occur. So I think that given all that variability, we do, and I think this is where the methodology, do we have robust methods to characterize and quantify these reaction byproducts? And if we do, then we can talk about ways that we can, for example, with mixtures, we've added hazard indices, that's one approach, uh, but there may be other approaches. And my colleagues, we've talked about ways that we can do that, models, tools to do that. And I think this is an important research that, with, that we've heard in, just in this conversation. How can we really measure and quantify and characterize those, those mixtures that occur? Thank you, Trey. Other comments from the panelists? I'm going, oh, excuse me, Barb. Dr. Barbara Turpin. Well, I was thinking I enjoyed your talk a great deal, Crystal, and um, uh, and I enjoyed having a conversation with Antonia at lunch today. So it got me thinking about the focus of the exposome largely uh, work has largely been on biomarkers of exposure. And I don't know that much about what happens once chemicals are in the body. Um, but... Um, it got me thinking about, you know, to what extent do we need to worry about um, uh, transformations in between when people are exposed to something and when they end up in your blood, let's say. And, you know, if we might be fooling ourselves in terms of what we think the exposures are. So I know probably both of you and maybe all of you up there have been thinking about these questions. 
I can try to start by saying like, we are all interested in measuring exposure, but we cannot measure exposure. We only assess exposure. So we have different tools uh, to, to measure concentrations of mainly exposure biomarkers. There are other uh, biomarkers of effect, and uh, but here we've been talking mainly exposure biomarkers. So we find concentrations and we tend to think high concentrations mean high exposures. And it's true at a certain time, but like the exposure may have been very high a long time ago, but by the time we captured that sample, the exposure was gone. So, or the, the body had got rid of the, 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 the chemical. So it's really a complex scenario. And, uh, and then I think that like the measurements that I'm most familiar with that are like biomarkers, uh, biomonitoring is a snapshot, um, gives you an, a snapshot idea of the concentrations of the chemical. Um, when you look on a population basis, which is what we do at CDC, then on average, you know, in some cases you're gonna look at high concentrations and low concentrations that kind of average out. And on exposure on a population level, which is what we're interested for, population health or public health, we get a pretty good idea of exposure to different the chemicals that we're looking for. Again, like Elaine was saying, we're looking under the lamppost. Um, if we want to, uh, and all depends on the question that you're trying to address, the, the information that you're trying to get. So if you want to have like an agnostic, you know, going and saying, what are we supposed in indoors? What are the chemicals that we're finding? A targeted approach may not be the best one unless you want to remediate those exposures. Initially, you want to know everything that is in there. So a non-targeted approach, the use of the, 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 the silicone markers, that, that's perfect, much better than collecting blood or urine because you're not going to have standards for all of that. So I, I don't know if I answered your question, but again, this is what I'm trying to say that all these different approaches to assess exposure are in my mind complementary. And this is only measurement. You need to get information about the sources. You need to get information about how often people use the chemicals and so on. Or the... Thank you, Antonia. Uh, Dr. Turpin anticipated a question I was going to ask related to that. Um, Jason, I know that you also have have concerns about comment, please. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think oxidation pathways are, you know, not well understood. Um, they're not well appreciated either. Um, and because of that, the IH uh, community is just doesn't recognize them. And so, you know, the question is of what should we be measuring? You know, we have some type of health effect that may occur, but you know, what what chemical or compound is causing that health effect? You know, um, I think. Trying to understand that is, you know, what you're trying to say. So, so I just wanted to sort of point out that the power of the exposomic approach um, is, and why I think there's a useful analogy that could be then that you know already Crystal's looking at in terms of environmental exposures is that you're, you know, they really um, look, they do look at. at biomarkers typically of effect and then work out from there and they're looking in case control they're they're looking in two different groups and they're saying what's the same and what's different and when they find something that's different then then it leads you to to go learn more right so that would be um so rather than trying to figure out every little uh, uh, every little exposure and every little effect and every little transformation whether that be in the environment or in our bodies we're first doing the um, data-driven discovery, the, the screening measures, the data-driven discovery, and then you go into, you know, sort of, you'll have clues as to which things are the real big important things that we need to study more carefully. Um, thank you, Elaine. Now there's potential, well, it's tricky, right? Uh, as Dr. Williamson pointed out, think of, think of ozone. And we know that there's, uh, Good epi showing correlations between ozone increasing and morbidity and mor mortality increasing. But we also recognize that we actually inhale roughly as much ozone indoors as we inhale outdoors. But indoors, we're also exposed to the products of ozone-initiated chemistry, typically at two or three levels higher than, than indoor ozone. So how do we know that the health effects that we're ascribing to ozone aren't due to the oxidation products? 
So you, you see the, the point I'm trying to make in terms of making those kind of associations. Yeah, absolutely, which is why you, which is why once you see those differences, so you're you're now taking where you've seen a difference, right? And now you're saying, here's the research question that we have to investigate. So absolutely, hundred percent. Thank you, Jason. I'm going to come back to you, please. Um, our work environments are changing. They've certainly changed since the pandemic. Uh, we have more remote workers. We have more DIY workers. We have more Amazon workers. Um, how do these changing work environments affect the link between indoor chemistry and indoor exposures? That's a very tricky question, but an important question. So, um, you know, thinking about the pandemic, um, 2018, 2019, there was only 5% of us that were doing some type of telework or hybrid work. In 2020, that spiked to 40 to 50% doing some type of hybrid work. After COVID, did it drop back down? No, it only dropped back down to maybe 25 to 30%. So it'd be interesting to figure out, and because we're doing that, we're, you know, we're spending more time at home, we're doing more activities at home, you know, we're, we're working, but we have these extra activities where we cook and clean and introduce more chemicals than at home, which we're already spending a lot of our time at. So it would be also interesting if during that trend where we saw this up spike of people being at home, do we see an uptrend in illness? related to non, well, non-COVID related illness during that time. There's probably a lag in there somewhere, right? Because it didn't occur immediately, right? So that'd be an interesting thing for remote work. Um, as far as uh, do-it-yourself work or doing a uh, new gig economy, where we have now approximately 5 million workers involved in the gig economy, and that's people bringing extra income, uh, doing other in, uh, other in jobs. Uh, you know, examples be Uber and Lyft, but this also includes um, making products at home, um, for instance, 3D printing. You know, so we're bringing in new chemicals and new um, processes into our home, introducing new chemicals. And as Delphine pointed out earlier, thinking about we're bringing in, if we add new chemicals to our homes, how does that affect the chemistry? And we need to think about that cautiously. As far as Amazon workers as well, I mean, you're, you're talking about, uh, you know, Amazon, I think, employs 1.6 million uh, workers. Um, there's, I think, 110 fulfillment centers in the United States. Each one holding uh, has about 1,500 employees in these large warehouses that are about 600,000 square feet. And so you can think about all those products there and all the emissions that occur in those places. What kinds of chemistry are they exposed to? Thank you, Jason. Trey. Yeah, uh, Jason beat me to it. I was going to earlier to your earlier question, you know, I've been involved in nanotechnology for several years, and I think it's important to talk about these new materials. Uh, and now the, the term du jour is ADMA, advanced materials. So as we still deal with traditional chemicals, there are these new types of chemicals that are that are coming into commerce. I think the technology changes is something that I deal with in my program, and it's very interesting. One, Jason talked about 3D printing. And so we have now consumers, we have manufacturing in our homes. So we talk about raw materials. Some of these use powders, others use thermoplastics. And so it came a question, you know, should they even have, you know, child resistant packaging, you know, in the home, you know, children and others may have access to just the raw materials. And certainly when we talk about the printing, the emissions that occur, you know, are, do you have the kinds of, you know, you know personal protective equipment or engineering controls? And really, this we now have the subpopulation of manufacturers. Do they have the health and safety training that they need? And I know NIOSH has recently put out some guidance on 3D printing. So, you know, this whole idea of, of this trend of manufacturing, also with our electronic e-platforms, you can get just about any material from anywhere in the globe. And this whole idea of supply chain. Uh, you know, what types of materials are going into these products. And that's going to impact the emissions that occur during the product production and what happens across the life cycle of that product. You know, for example, if we have a toy that's less durable, does it degrade more rapidly? Does it release particles into the indoor environment? So I think this is a very interesting time as we see these new technologies, new types of materials that are being used, 
And do we understand? And so it goes to your other question too. Do we have the uh, techniques, the, the uh, analytical techniques to be able to measure them? One uh, area that's really very interesting, or there's a lot of interest, are the micro and now nanoplastics. You may have heard about that. And it's 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 and and three D printers actually may produce these. And so there are questions about how can we can measure these nanoscale plastics or micro, what's contained in them. So uh, this is a new area of research where we do need uh, a lot of questions to be answered. Thank you, Trey. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and then I think the other element, too, is that there's also a push about um, recycling plastics, um, like uh, cleaning bottles, Tide bottles, game bottles, and such, and making those into filaments that you could do 3D, 3D printing at home. And so understanding those new types of missions that could occur there could be, uh, I mean, I think it's deserved a, a study on that. And that's another layer of complexity to it. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Crystal. You're doing multidisciplinary research. And um, my question to you has to do with funding for this type of research. Have you encountered barriers trying to trying to find funding for the multidisciplinary research? Uh, I'm concerned about the funding, different agencies that are funding perhaps being a bit too siloed to support multidisciplinary research. Your comments, please. Uh, that, that's a wonderful question and uh, a challenge that I deal with regularly. How do we go from understanding the sources, the chemistry of the sources to the exposure to the health? And the nature of our, our funding bodies really is, as you say, it is siloed. It is predominantly focused on health or focused on characterization of the, the chemistry of the sources. Uh, and I'm really hopeful as we move more into this exposomics approach, there's a recognition that we need to think holistically and we need to be more comprehensive with our measurements. And that would then allow for the means for recognizing that we need to have these robust, reliable, rigorous measurement technologies that will operationalize our ability to, to look at health. And by having that team science approach that is transdisciplinary, uh, that will then allow and pave the way for, for increased funding that will go all the way from source through to, to health. Thank you, Crystal. Delphine. Yeah, uh, I've been really enjoying this panel and I would really love to hear your thoughts on different mechanisms of exposure, namely how much does it matter if a compound is in the gas phase versus a particle phase versus an ultrafine particle, something really small. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and, and where you think the research gaps are in terms of how those different types of um, mechanisms or, or places where chemicals reside, how much that matters. Panelists? I, I think it's, you know, I think it's a question, you know, it's an important question. You know, the fate and transport within the indoor environment, what happens? For example, uh, if you have, um, and, and this is when we looked at, for example, wood products and you're, you're sitting on the deck and you come in and you sit on the couch and, you know, what happens to those particles? Or if there is an indoor air release, you know, does it deposit onto surfaces? You know, and particularly with children, you know, who may crawl on the floor and so forth. So I think one of the questions is the receptor. You know, if we're talking about young children that may mouth more and so forth, the resuspension and the deposition of these in the indoor environment is important. I think uh, looking at things like furniture, we certainly, and I think earlier talked about like the walls and other things absorbing and re-releasing. But I think also too with the particulates, you know, what happens to those if it's on the couch, the, the, the mattress and so forth. I think that adds, you know, another layer of the complexity. And do we understand that sort of, again, fate and transport life cycle of these particles uh, in, in the end and also airborne? Uh, but again, what happens? Do they deposit out, you know, that whole dynamic, I think, in understanding that if you want to call it the life cycle, I don't know what term we would use for it, but I, that certainly is a question. Antonia, did you want to also speak? Just wanted to say, I mean, it depends. Many of the chemicals that we're exposed indoors are chemicals that somehow we bring indoors, but we do not know uh, 
that we did, you know, like we use products uh, all the time. And then sometimes people assume that because of the food that we eat, we may, if you don't buy organic products, then, then you may be exposed to pesticides. But, you know, by the use of personal care products, then we are, we bring who knows how many chemicals home, but yet we are only aware of the chemicals that are on the label of the of the product, not some of the other chemicals that are in there. So this goes into like the citizen science that Robin was talking earlier today in terms of prevention. You know, we, we keep on looking at the exposure very reactively after the exposure has already happened. And uh, wouldn't it be beautiful that we, if we know that something is gonna be harmful, we prevent this project from happening. And then so we stop bringing the products or using the chemicals in the products. Forget about regrettable substitutions, but that's a different story. But what I'm trying to say is it really all depends on what you're trying to do with the information that you get. Um, if uh, the chemical from like, when we look at a chemical, we look at a blood sample or a urine sample, we do not know what came from the from ingestion, from, uh, from inhalation or from dermal exposure. We only know that that person was in contact somehow to that chemical. And, uh, you know, again, from a, a, a exposure standpoint, it would be good to know if you wanna stop that exposure from happening so you can prevent it uh, from day one if you want. So again, be more proactive rather than reactive. Um, this is not only in indoor, in all type of chemistries. I just don't know whether we're in there, but I think we're making steps toward that, uh, you know, with this posamic concept. If you want people want to know what they're supposed to and they, to get a better idea of what they can do in order to stop those exposures from happening. Thank you, Antonia. We're technically out of time, but does the gentleman who's been standing for a couple of minutes, please identify yourself and ask your question and then we will break. Um, hi there, this is Charles Bevington from CPSC. Um, you can either respond to the question or just think about it and take it home with you. Um, but as I've been thinking about everything that's happened today, I've been thinking a lot about timing of exposures. And one of the questions that we ask at the beginning is, does this chemical or agent contribute to an effect either at a lifetime level or a chronic long-term level or a intermediate level or an acute level? So the question was, what kinds of tools, measurements, techniques would we need, you know, probably different complementary tools to answer that question at different time scales? I think that's a very good question. And let me suggest that we think about that. <laughs> and and I, I thank you for the question and I thank the panelists for being here. I thank you who are here in person for your attention. I thank the people who are remote for uh, logging in. Enjoy the break.